Yeah, so for this video, we're going to go through chapters 13 and 14 in your book, uh, Simple Regression and Multiple Regression. Well, first of all, you may think of what is regression. Um, so I'm going to use some slides to help us get caught up. It's very simple, one of the most useful tools in statistics. So uh, let's go ahead and get the screen share started. And here we go, and hopefully you're seeing the slides. I'm not going to go through the whole deck, but just a few, uh, just to kind of, where you can see what regression is, what we're trying to do. So uh, you can probably see this says chapter 14. Well, that's in the MBA book, which is written by the same author, so it means the same stuff as what you have. So what is regression? Well, it says it right there. I mean... Linear regression, it's a line that starts with the outcome. Let's use our y variable, or we call it a dependent. This is what we're trying to predict. And then we got regression. So it moves backwards through all the factors that got us here. or X variables. And you're thinking, well, if we already know the outcome, why do we need to know what got us here? Well, because unless, you know, the world ends tomorrow and as weird as it gets, you know, it may very well do it, but we're assuming that we're going to use these factors kind of determine what weight each one has, how much impact and, you know, what we need to adjust to get another outcome for next period, next month, next week, um, next business venture, new towns, whatever. I mean, you can use this stuff once you have, you know, a good idea of um, which inputs have the most effect on your output you know you can use it to predict different things on down the line so that's that's basically what it is um in its simplest form if you start at zero you move we talk about it's just a line so you know your aggression constant is just the slope if you start at zero uh, with any two factors and go to the end, then the slope of that line is simply going to be the correlation between any two factors. So, if y'all remember doing correlation, um, so we'll start. I'm just going to go ahead and start with what we're looking at. Like I said, you got a dependent. Our response variable, that's your outcome. That's what we're looking to determine. That's what we're trying to figure out. And then the independent. Independents are just factors or inputs. And then you end up with an regression equation that looks something like this. So what these terms are, You got a B and all the beta factors, those are the weights we were talking about, the impact, how much each thing, uh, what kind of effect, you know, each thing has. So let me pull up a blank screen. So assume we have everything we do plotted on a standard graph. It's very hard to write with the mouse again. And normally we're only looking at quadrant one here if there's no way to have negative. So maybe these are 
that's my doctorate's in marketing. We'll stick with marketing stuff here. Maybe these are sales figures and maybe along the X axis, uh, customer service. Ratings, whatever. If you assume customer service ratings are zero, would lead to nobody buying anything, you could start at one and you know, maybe plot all these different things. Along a line, so your beta no it's going to be you know the impact or basically the slope caused by this factor x your beta zero is going to be where it crosses the x-axis so if you only got one factor And you know, it starts at zero, then the beta naught doesn't matter. And maybe it doesn't. Maybe you can assume, no matter how bad you are. Assume no matter how bad you are, you're going to have a certain level of sales. So maybe there's a floor here that's not zero. No matter what you do, you hang your name on a shingle, put it on the door, somebody's going to walk up and buy something because otherwise, how would they know whether your customer service ratings are good or not? You know, whether they have the rate. So maybe there's a floor here. This is what beta, beta zero would be, where it crosses that line your y-intercept. So a regression line, if y'all remember, all the way back in seventh, eighth grade, y equals mx plus b. Where m's a slope. B's a y-intercept. Well, we got a different equation we use in statistics. We don't necessarily like it. We have A plus BX. Where this A is a constant. Or your Y-intercept. So you'll see it written as intercept. Um, sometimes you'll see it written as constant. Your B It's going to be the impact that this variable x has and then plus you'd have an error term because nothing we do is statistics perfect um so for every one increase once we run you know this equation get this line every one increase in customer service ratings would leave leave us whatever this beta one turns out to be increase in sales. See that in a minute. So that's really all. So this B one, if you only have one factor is a slope. Of the relationship between X one and this value of Y. If you know you, your y-intercept is zero, then that's just the correlation that we calculated all the way, all the way back in chapter three. So that would be, you'll see a regression equation and I'll show you that in a minute too. Um, if this matters is different from zero and you know and meaningful and you're watching it 
your core is going to be a little bit different than correlation because over time you have to take in consideration you know you know the floor okay so you'll end up with a regression equation you like we just showed you your constant which you'll see sometimes written as a Beta one x one. In chapter fourteen, we went on we had beta two x two, however many, plus whatever error term. Don't want to get too far ahead right now. So that's what we're looking at right here. Is this equation y equals b one x one plus e or b naught plus b one x one plus you know whatever this error term is for, for the equation uh, regression parameters uh, usually you'll all it'll just be uh, coefficients is what those would be called like I said it's just a line So why do we have to do it? Well, spam. Uh, let's see back here what I was drawing on. Well, if you're predicting, then what, what does this all mean? More importantly, if you've got any two points on a line using y equals mx plus b, right, you can determine the slope. Based on what that is, you know, you got that y intercept and then the rise over run. No, you want. You know, for every increase in X, you got whatever increase, you know, in Y. But, if every point you were looking at fit perfectly on this line, that would be great. Because you would have a correlation of one. And your line would be perfect. Well, in the real world, it doesn't always work that way. You're going to have different points and different uh, values. Those dots are going to be all over the place, so we have to figure out where to draw that line when, when none of them fit perfectly on there. So that's where I'm kind of going to switch over. Or you can see it here. Every one of these distances off the line is an error term. Or a deviation. So this distance between every one of them for this slope, this y-intercept, for this value x1, every little distance here is going to be Pretty much what we have, you know, your x minus x. Well, so I shouldn't say that. 
the average value of the line. It's going to be similar to what we did when we did x minus x bar. So there's going to be a deviation, except for instead of x bar, it's the you know, the equation for this line, for the distance between its expected value. given this correlation. And then we ended up with a bunch of terms. You see where this comes from. This is, what was that, our covariance? And this over the covariance itself, which is the variance. Except for instead of n, you know, n minus one here, it's just over n. So we calculate all these and say as long as you have these numbers, what they tell you is so here your x squared. It's just the factor squared, then you get the average, or that's the sum. This value is the sum of those. So this is how we calculated covariance. I mean, yeah. And this is just the squared value of the term. And then they say, man, once you have those, you no longer need raw data. Well, we're going to do it a little different because uh, we're not going to be calculating all these things by hand. We're going to use Excel. But the purpose is what regression does is all these little distances. It calculates this line. All of these are error terms or deviations. So we're going to square all these terms basically to keep the uh, pluses from canceling out the, you know, the minuses. We'll square the difference and then it's going to calculate the line that minimizes. So, you know, it's going to try this line, or try this line. This, the line that minimizes the sum of all these distances for every piece of data we have. Every one of these points, given what we have, that's the best information we had to make this decision. We're going to sum up all these error terms, and then we're going to use that to determine which slope and intercept is going to give us the lowest error for the whole thing. Luckily, we have tools to do that for us. But we're not going to be calculating regression by hand, and I don't know many people that do. Uh, Y'all never have to do it by hand. I'll show you where the numbers come from, so you mean, but um, yeah, we're not going to calculate that by hand. So then, you know, these are back seeing what a correlation is. So if you know what the correlation is for each term, you can tell whether the relationship is positive or negative. So this one's a perfect correlation. It means for every one in unit, whatever you're looking for out, you're gonna have one unit 
increase in y. So the one perfect one unit correlation, these I mean it doesn't have to look like this. Those units can you know um you can still have a one that looks a little different. It's just easy for students to understand this. Um means every dot fits perfectly on that line. You're never gonna see that. You'll see something like this. So how do you calculate that line that minimizes the distance from every one of these dots to that line? If you see something like this, you've got virtually no relationship. It's not a good relationship. So your correlation term R will be close to zero. This is a negative one for every one increase in uh, X, you come down one for Y. Never going to see perfect. You hope not to see this, but you will. Um, that means you need to find another factor because this factor isn't predicting your outcome. More than likely you're gonna see, well, these are actually pretty good. Some you'll see look more like this than this, but you can kind of actually tell. So what we're gonna be doing is calculating this line. So on average, we can use that to predict at any given point of X, what the Y is gonna be. Um, These are some of those formulas you'll need. So uh, let's look back. You know, just kind of go over some of these formulas just to show you. Um, yeah, basic regression. What you need to know, I mean, this is how we calculate all of it, but Excel does it for us. So said you don't really have to uh, the, the slope there intercept and then multiple regression we'll get into standard error we'll calculate it for you uh, and how we calculate the T for T values I'll give you one where you have to do that um, to determine a confidence interval, depending on which program software you're doing, it may or may not give you a confidence interval. And if you need it, we'll go over how to calculate those quickly. We've got, you do it the same way. If you want a confidence interval for any beta, correlation coefficient beta, then you get your, your um, whatever the coefficient is, plus or minus the T value times the standard error, just like you do anything else. So standard error, most software is gonna give you that. The T value has got a different degree of freedom. So rather than just N minus one for the whole model, you're going to go in minus k minus one, where k that should be in minus k plus one, should be. Oh, I see, yeah. They're showing N minus K minus one, where K is the number of terms that you're looking at. But if we only got one, like this chapter, it's gonna be basically N minus two. So you got two different things that you're looking at. One, the K equals the number of terms. So 
uh, and that, that we were just talking about, you know, whatever your customer service value, that would be one decay, one thing, and one term, and the plus one comes in for your intercept. So however many variables you're looking at, however many number of X's plus the intercept. It's where you're going to get your T value, so that's going to be a little bit different. So let's go through and kind of look at what this is. Your book, this is the for those uh, for those slides, the PowerPoint slide from your book. This is the data set in the Tasty Sub Shop. So let's kind of go over what progression is and. Where we get those and where this stuff comes from. Then I'll show you how to run a regression and then we'll kind of look at the, the value. So, say, let's just look, uh, start with just the population size. So, we've got 10 restaurants. Looks like they're ranked in order of sales revenue in thousands per year. So we've got like 500,000 all the way up to a million to population size in those units. You can see it pretty well follows bigger populations in the area. You're going to have more revenue. You would expect that. So let's see what the correlation is. Equals core. C O R E L. Array one, so the correlation between population and sales. It's a correlation. Population revenue. Okay, how that differs in what we would get for regression. It's going to be, you can calculate slope in Excel. So, so if you only got one factor, you don't have to, you can do it all in a chart. The scatter graph, you can run a regression or you can just do this, slope. It says known wise. Y is always your dependent, you know, your outcome. Known X's, looking at population, so. That's your slope, 15. So for every 15, and we got 1,000 here. Population in thousand for every fifteen thousand increase for every one thousand increase you get fifteen thousand in sales. And where's our starting point? Our intercept. Type in intercept equals intercept. Known y's, comma, known x's, and there we go for intercept. Population revenue. Okay, so rather than me drawing this out again, how about you know we get an Excel do the drawing for a change. Back to home, or no, nope, go to insert. Just click anywhere on this chart. Insert charts, scatter chart. 
Okay, now to get what we want, click in if I remember how to do this, right click inside this. I'll keep seeing anything. Click select data. And then for each one of these, we're going to grab our X and then hit edit. Actually, we get the chart off of the graph so it'll be easier. Then right click inside the chart, click select data, and that's how we're going to set what we're graphing here. So let's just start with um, yeah, whatever. All this. We just look at all our X's. Population size. It's restaurants just different numbers. That's our number of observations. That's you know, you know, case numbers. We're not going. Look at that. So we'll start with population and edit um, series name. So I'll just go ahead and delete all this out so you don't leave something in. Series name. Ah, this thing, maybe I should have deleted that out. Your Y, your Y values. Just copy that. Your X values. That and your series name that's population. So there's the first one business rating. Hit edit series name, just whatever you call the label is. Let's go ahead and delete these. X value. This just you know. Y. In X. So make sure you got these plotted along and then you can just remove the rest of those. So you should have revenue hopefully along the Y axis and then whatever numbers these need to be. And there we go. So based on what we have here. What's up? I'll blow it up where you can see what some of this stuff means. Hopefully. All right, so now I'm just going to go ahead and click this. Let's look. I'm going to unclick business rating. We're just going to look at population first. So we got this nice line. Apply. I if it's still there. Okay. Now. All these plots here. So it will draw your line for you. If you click plus, Trend line linear. That's your slope. That's your linear regression equation. You click more options. We'll give you your regression equation and then what we call an R square, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, Then you can go ahead, it's like we're like 20, so let's go backwards, maybe 25. Yeah, go forward 25 too, just kind of see. Get that out of the way. So this is our line, kind of, you can see, maybe I went forward too far. Oh. I went forward 250. Let's not do that. There, now we can kind of see. If 
for all these different values for population. So in general, no matter where we build, we're gonna have this level of sales, which is your intercept here, 183.31. And for every 15.596, or every 15,000, since this is in thousands, every 15,596, uh, every 1,000 increase in population, rather, gives us 15,596 in revenue. So how we use this, our regression equation would be y equals or y hat equals one eighty three point three one plus Fifteen point five nine six to mix one. So this is B naught plus P one X one plus an error term because like I said all these dots are not gonna be perfectly on the line. It's just our best best estimate that's how we use the forecast so let's assume assume that we're going to build a new new um, store in town with a pop population of uh, 80,000 what's our expected revenue for the year for yearly revenue Well, I'm choosing 80 because it's right on the line there. It's going to be wherever, you know, this. Here, so you can find that value by plugging in. For value eighty x um, times 80 and where what can I see what is that times 80 that would be what 1247 183.31 value of 80 would be whatever and those two together best estimate 1430 which is about what that looks like yeah so that's how you use a regression line. So, where this stuff comes in useful, we'll just go ahead and we 
I know I'm going real slow and that, but kind of make sure everybody's on the same page. What we're doing, kind of see what these, what these numbers come and how they can be useful. Um, you could probably make a pretty educated guess since all these are pretty close to that line. What happens when they're not? Let's look at the correlation. Or business rating. And revenue. The slope, the intercept, you can't easily, you can't easily predict that. Apply, just click the different gradient and apply. See, without knowing kind of where you stand, be hard to tell how much business rating is going to have. I mean, you know, as one increases, it should. But then, you know, those people use them differently. People within the population use your overall business rating differently to value how much money they're going to spend with someone. So, go plus and hit a trend line here. And then click display equation, display you know, off square. See, now we have this. So this should match up exactly equals correlation. C O R E L, and then uh, I should have got the chart out of the way first. So. When they're not well correlated, it's hard to tell. So, two or one. This would go X and Y on correlation. Point nine. Oh, I just did the same one. Here. Relation between business rating and sales a little less defined. 0.56. You can see it's not nearly as easily, but we can draw this regression line and still use it to estimate. Rather than just you know a correlation. So equal slope. Y's and X's. Seven point so just doing this show you they're the same intercept rise and x's and it crosses down here. So if you extend that line on out, that's where you're gonna cross at five sixty. Remember, the higher this number for your intercept is, that's without regard to this x value, that's what you expect. So the higher this intercept number is, um, the, the less information we're getting you know, from whatever factor we're looking at. So the less important the slope really is to the overall thing, to be honest with you. So, So 
So here you expect, you know, for every, starting with a baseline of 560,000, for every one increase in your customer ratings chart, and that's what we're assuming these business ratings, uh, for every one increase in business rating, expect a 57,000 increase in revenue. And that's where we get into what this number R squared is. That tells you how much of your Y value is explained by your two, your two factors, your regression line really. So it only explains here 32%. 32% of your revenue is explained by this equation. It's a plus negative, so it can just be minus. That's a negative slope. I can, oh, no, that was me drawing earlier. Right. Okay. So three two, yeah. Thirty three thirty two percent of this value Y is explained by this. That's what that tells you. So Still important explains like a third of a third of what you're looking for. Yeah, I'm getting all kind of emails here, which is really aggravating. But yeah, I'm gonna close it. Keep that from bothering me. So that's really what you know regression is telling you to chart it. So how do we do them? I'll show you how to do a simple Excel and get these numbers. This is the same data here. I just have it preloaded. So let's go back to data, your data analysis tool pack. Scroll down and hit regression. So we're going to look at this regression between our Y range, our dependent variable. Go ahead and copy. Go ahead and copy your labels. Drag it down. And for simple regression, let's look at population size. Then we'll choose our output. And we'll just put it put it down here. Click labels. You can go ahead and click your confidence level. Um, it's, whether you click that or not, if you click that, it gives you, you know, the ability to change it. 95, we'll just use an alpha level of, of, of 05. Um, go ahead and click residuals and standardize residuals. You can click these probability charts if you want. The graphs aren't that good. Uh, they become more important when you have more factors, but I still, if you're using you know, fancy tools like SPSS, JAP, something like that, eh, they're going to be better, more valuable. Just go ahead and click OK. 
but I, I never use them in Excel because they're not really that great. For some reason, no matter what you do, it's going to give you this confidence level twice in Excel. Just go ahead and delete one if you don't want to look at it. So here, here's those numbers we're looking at and the things. Here's your output. Here's those confidence, those fishes. That's the same we had on the chart, right? 15.59183.31 So it's going to give you a little more when you pull it out. So once you get to where you can just look at these numbers and see that graph, uh, you don't really need the scatter plot. But I mean, you yeah, know, once you get there. So let's go through and see what these numbers are. Your R squared. Remember, that's your amount of variance. Variance independent, explained by this model. And model, if you only have two and you choose to see the uh, intercept, it's just that one graph. So. Adjusted R square. The more things you're looking at at one time, and there's a formula, it's on your PowerPoints. I'm not going to make you calculate it. Just know that it reduces the variance a little bit to account for those error terms if you're looking at like five different things and how they, you know, impact. That's chapter 14, really. So this is your N or your sample size. Here's your standard error. Or the model. So what we're looking at and what it's printing off, to tell whether this is any good, it automatically gives you an ANOVA. Your regression factors or your treatment. Your residual is the error. Your residuals are those deviations like on that graph, that line. The degrees of freedom. Here we got. For the ANOVA, eight, because we uh, one, because we only had a uh, number of groups was just two here. A factor in our residual, so sigma is one is one. In factors for you know intercept and population size, obviously. So this will leave you eight. But there's only one group, so overall ten minus one is nine. So um, sum of squares. Total error and regression error or your residual error. So your residual, like remember we said that's the distance between where all those points are and where that line actually comes through. Um, what's left over, what's not explained by that prediction is a residual. You can think of it like a remainder. Uh, your F value, you want to make sure this is significant at whatever level. So 122, usually they are going to be. That's highly significant. Make sure that's good. At least at 05 level, you really want it more. And then we're going to have different levels of significance for each of these factors that we're looking at. So for this coefficient, and this is going to be beta naught.
making this for issue constant. And this is x1. So variable one. So this coefficient, x2 beta 1. Here's your standard error for, remember there's a different standard error. This is a standard error for the prediction of this constant or intercept. Then you have confidence level for those predictions. Well, your confidence level for your intercept, you know, since it, you know, it really doesn't, you're not using the intercept to predict. That's just what's left over, not really explained by, you know, the rest of the model, really. So that's kind of meaningless. You do want to see, you know, look and see whether it's, significant because when you're using this thing to predict whether or not you include it in there if it's not significant you wouldn't use it in your regression equation when you're trying to use it to forecast so this is different than the standard error for the entire model it's for each individual coefficient here you got a standard error for this and that you used to calculate your t stat and your p value to tell you where the individual factors are any good. And that's the main thing we're looking at here. So if you're going to try to predict what these cells would be in what we did a while ago in a population of 80,000, you'd use that coefficient times 80,000, then use the standard error and t-stat not the t-stat, you use the standard error and then whatever your uh, level of alpha, 0.05, the t-stat for you know alpha over two to create this confidence level. So where do these come from? Actually, they're already calculated for you, which is nice. Um, This T is going to be your coefficient. Divided by your standard error, that gives you your T. Your P value. It's naturally going to be based on you know the T chart for this particular uh, test statistic, uh, statistic. So to create calculate these, you're going to need. Your critical T at whatever alpha level. So you do it exact same way. This is going to be this coefficient plus or minus T of alpha over two times the standard error. So 
So we get you t over two. Do it the exact same way. Um, but your degrees of freedom n minus k plus 1. So what is that? k is the number of x's you have. Plus 1 for that intercept. How many things you're looking at basically is what it amounts to. So for this one, it'd be n minus 2. Uh, I think the sample size here was 10, so that would be 8. So that's how you calculate those. Because so, if, if you're just doing sample size minus 1, it's going to give you a wrong number. You're going to get a wrong answer for that one problem I gave you. So um, down here, let's look at what these are. These residuals. For every value that we had on there, which one do we do? Yeah, this is yearly. Those residuals, uh, let's go back to this one already had chart. Those residuals are going to measure, you know, the difference here. Swap it. Um, since I've got business rating here already drawn up, just to show you. Let's go ahead and run a regression for business rating. Three, input range, that doesn't change. Um, let's come down here. If you click constant is zero, and you only have one factor, then your beta coefficient is gonna be the correlation. So if you're just looking at the impact of one factor or the impact of two or three factors, you click that constant zero, you're cutting out all the other noise. Problem is it may over predict those, those variables sometimes if you don't automatically you know, let it look at the big picture as a whole. So we're going to click residual, standard residuals, and there we go. So. And looks like I did not change where I put it from last time, but that's fine. I just moved the graph around where I needed it anyway. So let's kind of see where these are and what they represent. We haven't figured it out now. These things are aggravating. Maybe it doesn't want to move it over there, does it? Okay. So your residuals, what they are, what they tell us. Standard residuals, that's just a Z value for actual residual. This the actual residuals, the difference between the predicted value. For revenue and what the actual was, the actual observation. Standardized, like I said, is a Z value for all these based on the expected is the mean. So you can look at your standard, you can kind of scroll through here, and these are all kind of in line based on what's expected. If you got anything that's, you can look at anything that's over two on your standard, so that's two uh, standard deviations away from your line here, but you really want to consider anything that's over three because that's an outlier. Maybe it wasn't an outlier based on the population, but 
uh, they don't follow what's expected of the population. You know, maybe they march the beat of different drums. So um, if they're that far off the beaten path for the population that you're looking at as a whole, then do you really want to set your business rules up based on, you know, that value? So maybe you want to delete it and run it again delete that observation right again or see whether that you know that matters if everything's kind of in line even even if one observation you know it's more than three standard deviations away when you look at the individual factors it still may not be a true outline for your model so um, these are what was predicted and there's your residual so what that is is look at value one here so for the first one your residual this is negative 206 the predicted um, 700 up here but the actual observation was five, so, or yeah, five something. Second one, this is a positive, no? Okay, so this is the second one. Oh, these are for businesses I'm looking at. Business rating, so that's your X2. These different observations, uh, they're not sorted by business ratings, which is why, you know, kind of a little diff more difficult to find them, but whatever we predicted here for 675, the one that's not showing me my. Actual, I don't know. Usually it shows you, you know, what your actual was and then you predicted. So for all these are like three, and it was two, then we had like a 527, which is a little lower than a seven or whatever. You know, you get the point. So for whatever value this is. Positive residuals are the ones above the line. Those are gonna be pretty high. That's probably gonna be like your 299. And 271. The predicted values. Then the ones that are below, these are going to be the ones, the lowest predicted values. Um, six and seven and eight, we yeah, had that's probably like a negative 125. Three. Like 184. So, I mean, that's how you figure out how far off you are. And that keep on the progression line just minimizes those squares. So, the thing is, you can use this to kind of forecast based on values of whatever your you know your known factors or inputs are okay here's the thing how 
how we look at a bunch of different, these are pretty far off. So these predictions, even though they carry less weight than those, because R squared is so much different. Do you do calculations for every one and then guess which one's gonna matter the most? No, so chart charts can only help you so far so much and, and correlations. You got a bunch of factors, you know, all impact sales. How do you know which ones to pay more attention to or which ones to adjust or which ones have the biggest impact? Well, that's where we get to chapter 14, I believe, in y'all's, which is your multiple regression. There you're going to end up with a different regression equation. Still got your intercept. You can put as many factors as you want in here. E2, X2, E3, X3, et cetera. Then tell uh, your overall error term. It's going to tell you give you a weight for each factor. So let's run a regression for all of these. And you do it exactly the same way. So here, your Y inputs are already, already in there. You got to make sure all your X's are together and all your Y's are together. So the ones that you want to look at, your X's and your Y's, make sure they're together so you can copy them all in one swoop. Here's all your X's. Just go ahead and grab them both. Click your labels. Uh, we'll click confidence levels. We'll go ahead and have them. So you can see how they differ. We're going to put it. Let's put it right here. Go ahead and click residual standard and okay. So here's where we end up getting delete these last two because to just take up space. Now Here, here's our R square. So with two different things in there. Plain variance. We're dependent. Here's what we got what's called a adjusted R square. So it's a little different. It just, it's a formula that kind of lessens the impact. You, you know, you've got a standard error for each of these. So it's just going to reduce the explained variance by a little bit because it's going ahead and acknowledging that none of these are perfect. They're all going to be a little bit less. So if you put more and more variables in here, you're going to have an arbitrarily high explained variance R squared. And usually in reality, you're never going to have a 0.98 anyway. But so they're different for each factor. If you put like 10 things in here, your R square is going to go through the roof, even though this one already is. So a lot of that's going to be, you know, error. So it automatically kind of drops it down a little bit the more factors you have in there. You want to use your sample size. 
number of observations. Sum squared for treatment for the error in your total. So this is the total variance in the model. This is a total variance explained by your regression treatment. So you get this number over this, that's where the R squared comes from. We want to look, make sure the model is significant in our ANOVA. It is. Now you come down here, here's your coefficients. See, it already has. You can look and see all of these are highly significant to the 05 level, so we can use them all. Then for each individual coefficient, you have an upper and lower bound. So if you wanted to know, use this regression equation, which is going to be for this one. Uh, equals 125.29 plus 14, it looks like 2 times population. The next one plus. 22.81 times the rating. Plus well, an error term, which is we're just, you know, there's gonna be some residual not explained, obviously, you know. So we don't calculate that, we just know it's there. For predictions, this is the model we use. So, you know, if we want to look at what revenue should be in town of 90,000, if we can keep, you know, standard business rating up to at least seven, then you plug those numbers in, and that'll give us our predicted sales, that market. For every individual observation that we have here, these residuals, for whatever those two terms are, it gives us the predicted value. So for observation one, we had a population nearly 21,000 with a business rating of three. It predicted we would have 489,000 in sales. And we actually did a little better than that. So that's how you read it and that's how you use them and that's pretty much what regression is. Um, let's jump ahead and do those. We'll quickly go through uh, starting at chapter 13. And here you run it. It's asking us to calculate or, or determine our regression equation line and calculate based on this one factor being 60. This is a one factor. So click your Excel file. Deliver open. Um, shut this down where I can use a little bit. So to solve this one, let's just go ahead, go to data, data analysis, regression, enter your Y value, which is direct labor cost. That's what we're looking for. Enter your X value, which is batch size. We're looking at how much Direct labor goes into producing whatever we're building here. 
based on how large our batch side is. You may click the labels and confidence if you want. Uh, output range, where we want to put, put it, put it right here. We put mine at D4, put it where we want. Click OK, and it's going to give us our answer here. So you just kind of open it up where you can see. What each, what's in each column here, key value. Again, we just got your confidence levels for each one. Uh, what were we asked to determine? Beta one, that's our, um, uh, they got them upside down on mine, I don't know about yours, I mean, maybe they're trying to trick you. Your beta one, that's gonna be coefficient for X one. Beta, beta zero, that's your intercept. Beta one, beta zero, your intercept. So 18 something for that one. Yeah, 10.146, 18.487. Uh, that's how you get those. Other questions. B1. It's estimated increase in mean labor cost for every one unit increase in batch size. So you can see if these are batch sizes, then according to this equation here, that you've got to put in there, you didn't even have to run it. They already have all this up here, didn't they? Okay. For every one increase in batch size, it gets multiplied by that coefficient, which is 10. So for every one increase in batch size, the mean labor cross increases by 10.1463. Um, beta naught is the mean labor cost when the batch size is zero. Your intercept, like I said before, that's the estimated cost when all your all your uh, factors are are zero. In here, y equals sixty based on this. So we'll just do that one real quick. Equals. So if y equals 18.487 plus 10.146 that size. What that question here is asking, what's the expected value of y, which is your mean labor cost for a batch size of 60? equals intercept plus 60 times coefficient one, 627.26, which is the answer. So that's really all there is to that question. If you wanna work it out using this math, be my guess, but nobody in the world does. Um, the people that do this are people like me that program these things. So. Um, so we have to know that we're putting them in correctly. I only expect you to be able to use the software. So let's go to the next question. Question two. This one, that did give you the formula based on how we calculate these standard errors. That's really the only time you'll do it. And it's just so you'll know where these numbers come from. And you get that straight from this uh, you know, formula here. If I can find it. I don't even have it. This is the, the actual, if you ever see the equation for your residuals, the E, the error term equals 
y minus predicted y, so your actual minus your predicted. Um, here it is, standard error for the estimate. equals MSE, which you can get right off the chart, uh, right off the regression output, or you can calculate yourself. The mean error for the estimate um, is gonna be your sum, sum of squares for the error, divided by N minus, we've got K minus one, so N minus the number of factors you have, Minus an additional one, uh, your book actually says N minus and then in parentheses K plus one, which basically does the same thing. So the variance there in our, for here you got one factor, so K is one. So you got SSE over N minus two. tells you that n is 11, so, um, and it's just the sum of error terms, squared error terms is 210.82, so you just, 210.82 divided by nine gives you the variant, or gives you s squared, then to get the standard error, you take the square root. 4.8398, so this here would be the variance for the, distribution of that line and S is going to be the standard deviation of it. So that's how you calculate the standard error for the equation. Here you don't really have to calculate anything. Well, maybe let's see what it gives you. Oh, we're doing a conference interval here for B1. Okay. It gives you you want a 95% constant interval for this slope or for this coefficient for B1. It tells you it's a simple regression model of one, two. Um and our sample size. So it tells you we've only got one factor and I think I already had this one done somewhere. So that's what we just looked at. Um, I just want to taste this up so. Maybe I'm crazy, I didn't have it worked out. Okay, so conference intervals. You got a coefficient. Maybe it's easier if I just type it. Interval for coefficient. That's going to see equals the actual coefficient. Plus or minus. T. T. 
the alpha over two degrees of freedom. Times standard error. So what does it tell us? We got n equals ten. We've got one factor, so it's k equals one. This is df equals ten minus one plus one. Equals eight. So we're looking at, I think it said alpha was. We want 95%, so alpha is 0.05. So we'll start with our coefficient. Which was 1.1 on mine. 121.61 T of alpha over two for eight degrees of freedom. T dot inverse two tails for confidence interval always. Uh, your probability 0 0.05. It automatically does the alpha over two if you click the two tails. Three of freedom eight, and it gives us 2.3060.04. Then did it tell us our standard error? Um, she didn't. And maybe have to calculate that. Just no, well, we can do it. Good sales. And the first one's expenditures. So and expenditures, so expenditures, we just go and say five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fifteen, fifteen. Revenue is one four. 125, and 90. Well, let's just do a quickly on our ignition on those. We'll get it. Copy that. Copy that. Click OK. 
Um, it's telling me I got didn't change the output to. Seven six mine didn't give me that. So in the answers they give us the standard error. Based on what I can see, I'm not sure that your your problem would have it. So, crap. And these aren't. Uh, we'll just go ahead and give you credit for that because we're never going to count off. But I'll show you how you would have if it gives you if you have this. Then you just multiply that 2.306 I just calculated by your standard error. Plus or minus is coefficient, so um, or some negative point seven six nine seven plus or minus t for point zero five over two. And eight degrees of freedom times this, and it gives you this. So I'm not sure based on this, since it's stated in the explanation that you have a picture that gives you the standard error. So uh, that's just somehow the uh, end of chapter exercises I had given y'all for these two chapters got deleted and they put just their basic preloaded, which is a bunch of crap. So um, y'all will get credit for most of the stuff I assigned to you because I didn't assign it. And I don't know what we're on. So for this one in chapter on four, they give you everything you need to know. So they're asking here that the, the F statistic for the model was well, right out of the chart. Extremely high. Um, so we reject the null because the P value is extremely low. Um, what do you include about the relationship between y and x? Very strong. If you only got one, if you only got one factor, and this f a is that strong, then the beta and, and t for that individual factor is going to be very strong. So. Um, the p value for the model, I just copy it right out of there. But you tell you at four zeros, you reject everything, reject the null at every one of those because obviously point one, point zero 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 is less than point one, point oh five, point zero one. So that's all that question's asking, and On this one again, the last you don't even have to calculate, you just pull it right out of the chart. Your F value, right where I showed you under the ANOVA. Um, significance 0 0.09. So, with a small sample size, your critical F would have been for whatever value they're looking at here, would have been much higher than 3.37 is what it's telling me. Um, so do not reject the 05 because this level of significance is higher than 0 0.05. That's the same thing, 0 0.01. What do you conclude about the relationship? Well, you know, if you only got one factor in there and the overall model is not significant, then that one factor is not going to be significant. So and the p-value for model is just asking you to put that in there and reject HO at point 0.1. That's the only one. 
10% level, we can accept it because it's less than 0.1. All the others, we would have to uh, reject the alternative objective model. And that is chapter 13. So let's go quickly to chapter 14. And there's only like two or three of those that you'll be expected to do because, again, it puts some questions in there and I will ask you anyway. I mean, stuff that you didn't even cover in this chapter. I don't know what's wrong with this book. Logistic regression, that's another chapter altogether. Um, and nothing we're gonna cover in this course, so. Let's go to the preview, work these out quickly. It shouldn't take long. Um, these, again, you're just kind of finding, it gives you this value. It gives you your R square, 88.5. You can calculate the R square, but you know, just by dividing this by this, that's the percentage of the total variance. The treatment. So adjusted R squares 83.9, so it's dropped a little, a little bit below the R squares. So obviously you got more than one factor. It tells us we have two. So n equals eight. And the sample size of eight, you want to run a regression. No matter what this says, um, I don't trust it. I would really, especially if you got more than one factor. Yeah, I mean, we'll try to get at least 50. I always like to shoot for 100, but you don't miss. You know, get enough so it's measuring some variance. So report SSE, S square, and S is shown in the output. Well, it gives you S, and you can find SS for the error. So 2.7524 is the answer to one. Uh, jump down here to S, it gives on mine at least, 0 0.7420, you get a you know a different number uh, on your question, but to get S squared, just square the S. Equals 0 0.7420, shift six two in Excel. Um, total variation, again, total variation, total sum of squares here. 23.99, unexplained, that's your residual, 2.7524. Your explained variation, that's your R squared. So you can either multiply 88.885 times the total, it's 88.5%, or you can just look up here, 21.243, or 21.2426, round it to be three. So the R square, it said 88.5. Adjusted R square, that's what that symbol means. 0.839. So 88.5%, when we write those up, it's just 0 0.885, 0 0.839. Now your F for the model, someone should have an ANOVA, yeah, 19.29. And then p-value, 0.0045, just pull it straight down. Reject alpha at all of those because, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me just move that one did her answer there, what was it? Yeah, okay. Rejected at this one. Can't reject at 0 0.001 because it's greater, 0 0.004 is greater. But for all three of those, we can reject. So it's less than, way less than one chance out of 100 this being wrong, it's very strong uh, according to them. So that one's easy. 
just reading and interpreting printouts. Here you have to calculate your It gives you the printout, the mini tab printout, which is just a add in plug in you have to use and pay for using Excel, but it gives you the printout for the regression. Doesn't give you the ANOVA, but it tells you, you know, the, the individual um, regression coefficient. So for your betas or your coefficients, just pull them straight down. For nine twenty three point three four seven for the first one, I'm not sure why it gives you a tolerant for error here when you're just pulling it straight out of the chart. But for B two, which is your rating there, three point three eight, easy. Um, yes, standard error, four point eight nine one, point two two eight five. And 0.4332. Your T value for the beta for, for the intercept is six. T1, 24 point from all you do is just pull them straight down. And it's going to ask you what all that means. So reject the null for the intercept at 05 because well, all of these are less than 05. Um, in less than 01. So, so we conclude that um, it's going to ask you the same thing. Yeah, reject. And there's just asking if, if it's significant. So at the 05 level, yeah, every one of those are below 05, so they're all significant. Uh, same thing for X2. And here it's going to ask you the same thing at 01. Well, all those numbers are way below 0 0.01, so same answers. Ask us the same thing at 001. All those levels are at 0 0.001 or below. So we reject the null for all of them and accept that the coefficient is good. Um, now the confidence intervals. Let's pull those up real quick. I have them already done somewhere. Or at least how to do them somewhere. Already worked out, so it's probably always tasty. So. That's for one. Um, okay, maybe I didn't. No, well, we can do it real quickly anyway. Yeah, this is copy what it gives you. And look at what he's asking for. All right, what does it tell us? Sample size is 10, so n equals 10.
We want the confidence level, 95% confidence interval for all of these. So 95%. So alpha is going to be 05. So for all of these, so we don't really calculate a confidence interval for the constant because you know what's the use? It's it's meaningless. So Let's look for beta, beta one, the confidence intervals with the set. Equals beta plus minus. Plus minus T over two degrees of freedom times standard error. So let's break it down and we'll see what we need to be looking for. Beta. We have to calculate this dude. And find um, that. See it a little bit. So start by let's see for beta one. So first, the beta is going to be five point six five. So that's our beta. T alpha over two, and it's gonna be the same for all of them, so we'll have to do this once. Um, so we'll need degrees of freedom. Yeah. It's gonna be N 10 minus K uh, plus one, so K is going to be one, two, plus one is three, so degrees of freedom is going to be seven for this one. So equals T dot and B dot two T probability point zero five Degrees of freedom, uh, freedom seven. So that's going to be the same for all of these. And then the standard error for beta one home size. Point two two eight five. So this one beta one. Two, so that's just going to be equals this minus this times this. How did that not work? D seven minus no, because these aren't formatted. 
those numbers. So 5.6128.2285. Here's the type of man. So, yeah, so the interval is going to be equals this minus this times this. That was going to be equals this plus this times this. And that gives us 5.07 and 1.653.7. Yeah. Now for B2. Three point eight three four four. Copy based and point four three three two. That's your standard errors. Coefficients. That's our degrees of freedom. So same thing here equals uh, this minus this times this equals this plus this times this and 2.81 Eight five and yeah, so there we go. And for 90, 99%, the next one, um, just go in here and change that to 0 0.01. Yeah, so get too many decimals, um, and that gives us a 99. So if we copy that for all of them. Four point one eight and six point yeah, six point one four and then two point three one eight and five point three so that's so yeah that. So that one is question two, question three. All you gotta do is read it straight out of the chart. Ninety five percent prediction interval. Now what's a prediction interval? Excel's not going to do that. Uh, whatever they used, whatever program they used um, to print out does. What a prediction interval is. You know, we had, let's, see. let's go back and see these observations. It gives you residuals. If you type whatever number they're looking at here, let's say we want to know the value of this of sales if the business rating for this particular one is you know five. So you type in five into that regression equation, which is 560 plus 57.73. That's going to be the prediction interval for Y um, when, when X is five, the answer. So you get a confidence interval on that prediction. It's different than the uh, confidence interval, 95% confidence interval for, that's for the uh, beta, your prediction interval, is on whatever amount you know you're predicting. So 
just whatever it asks for right here, 14.754 and 17, just pull it right down. If you get any observation that has a Y or dependent of 18.465, what does that tell you? Well, it's above the upper limit of, you know, put your confidence in, you know, so say that one's probably an outlier. It's unusually high. It's not what you're expecting. So that's all you're doing there is seeing if any, you know, you'd use that, you know, to see if you got an observation that's way out of line, maybe, you know, you want to take it out because it may be skewing the results of the rest. So, um, this one I gave you credit for because it's asking for moderation and stuff we didn't do. Plus, I'm not sure that their calculations are right. I don't think you square the actual value of X. I mean, the, the terms are just, oh, you do. Okay, now let's see. Anyway, I'll show y'all how to do it. Copy that in. So they're wanting, they're wanting you to, they give you the answer for, there are all the calculated values here, all the observed values for gas mileage, and these are different additives. Yeah, maybe they'll call this regular, we'll say that's lead. It, lead. And I don't know what octane is for. Octane booster or some other additive. And how it affects gas mileage. So the formula they're wanting to know here says x squared and x2 squared. So you just have to insert then insert. So that's x1, so this one's x squared. That's x2. This is x2 squared. So just hit equals this squared and drag it down. That one equals this squared. Drag it down, then run your regression. Data, data analysis regression. Okay, Y range. First, let me label this since they didn't. Okay, now. You just enter your data, data analysis regression, the Y range. Go ahead and catch your values. And you can only have one label, that's why I need that. So for this one, your X range is again, like I said, keep all your X's and Y's together. This is going to be a little different than that equation because you probably. Look They'll be in different order, but the same thing. So you can just click OK. OK, now they gave us a, they want to know what a point estimate for this equation is. So if 
if all those are, I think they told us to use Yeah, x1 is 1, x2 is 2. So what you want to know, y equals 0 plus beta 1 beta 1 x1 beta 2 that's it x um, squared Is two x one squared plus beta three here two beta four x two squared. They told us x is one and sorry, x one is one and x two equals two. So that means our equation is going to be y equals beta zero plus beta one. One plus beta for is x squared. Beta two times one squared is one plus beta three is the beta for x two. So does x two is two. So that was times two. Plus beta four times x two squared. Two squared is four. So that's the formula you look for. So that's going to be equals intercept plus beta one. Times one, I'll need to type that plus beta two plus two times the beta for x t plus four times because two squared is four. Um, that it should be 35.212, and that's what I got for mine. So that's how you do those. You probably can't see it if you haven't already done it. Um, it's a weird question. This one, uh, Excel won't even do logistic regression. I wouldn't have given you all that. So, um, we haven't covered it. We're not going to cover it. So, it's just a regression on discrete variables rather than continuous. So, that is those two. So, I will be back later on tonight to try to upload. We'll work to the practice exam, which we're preparing for the final exam, or for the uh, exam four. And I'll try to have that up sometime tonight, depending on how long it takes YouTube to upload. So, hope that helps. I know it was long, and especially I won't have time to edit this before you see it. So, um, see you all again next time.